but in Lindiwe's house holds at the time when we launched the case there were 20 people living on her property so we took that as a reflection of how a multi-dwelling household had to suffer with only six kiloliters per household per month and a prepayment water meter our second applicant grace munyai instead of a prepayment meter she took a standpipe because at a certain point um, after the city had disconnected people's water supply, they realized that it was absolutely unlawful to do so. So they then went back and offered people if they wanted a standpipe, and Grace decided to accept a standpipe. Um, and with a standpipe, which is a tap in the yard, your, um, your water supply is obviously no longer in the house. I chose the standpipe because I haven't got money to, when they put a prepaid meter, they said every month you must go and buy water. So when you buy water, only that water, this six, six, six kiloliters, is, is only uh, working for two weeks. We've always seen it as a form of punishment, a form of inconveniencing poor people. So she has to go every time she wants to do everything and fill a, pack, a bucket and take it to go and flush the toilet inside. They said that the stand pipe is going to drop it. If you put a bucket there, the water is dropped from 8 o'clock, we put the bucket till 4 o'clock the bucket is going to be full. I must uh, wait for a long time, for the whole day, to get the water. And if she connects her hose to the standpipe and brings it into her house, to the toilet, that is contravening the terms of a standpipe. And she, the, the punishment for contravening the terms of a standpipe is to get a prepayment water meter. So, in fact, it's, it's very, very um, pernicious. After every month, they come and check me to check the stand pipe where it's still going the way they put it. Hey, they, feel, they make you feel me bad because I don't like that. I was using the water before the way I want, so now they cut, they cut the water for me. The people of Peru, of course, are highly confused about it as well. They really don't understand why, why you would also in a progressive South Africa where there is an obligation to progressively realize the right to water, why you would move water outside someone's house and into the yard um, and inconvenience them and, and, and create problems in that way. But not many people chose the standpipe because it really is a severe regressive measure. But Grace did it because she wanted to ensure that she had enough water. It was the only way she felt she could ensure she had enough water because she has no money to buy water. The other applicants, uh, Jennifer Makatsani, Jennifer shows exactly the burden of living with a terminally ill person in her household, how very difficult it was to care for him in the home, to clean him, to wash him. Um, he had had a stroke and his foot went gangrenous. She couldn't wash his foot properly. properly. It's the gangrene spread and he died. And she also shows in terms of cultural rights how difficult it was to host a funeral at the house without any water. Uh, right now asking a neighbor it's very hard because we no longer help each other. Yeah. I remember during my father's funeral, you know, we had to do the, the intestines and clean them. Then, because we opened the gate to the neighbors, they had to close the gate because family members were going that side to use the, 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 the tap and the, and the toilet and they didn't want anything to do or else we will have to pay them so that they can go and buy a water units. Rather than that, you sneak out at night, you jump their fence, then you steal. But it's hard because when you are found out, they'll fight you. People are fighting over the most minimal amounts of water that you can have. And, and understandably, if you get a certain amount, you're going to say, no, I can't share with you, because if I share with you, well, then I'm not going to have enough for myself. And so it's a very, very, uh, it's, it's an incredibly negative, uh, it's an incredibly destructive process. Um, and it does, it affects solidarity, it affects communal uh, uh, sense of, 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 a, of a community as well. And it would happen anywhere. Um, if people were, were uh, put into a situation where they had to fight, literally had to fight over the crumbs from the table. And the two remaining applicants, um, Sophia Malakutu and uh, Vusamuzi Paki, Sophia explains how very complicated, she is a pensioner, she explains that she cannot understand the flashing signals of the prepayment water meter 
at all. She also explains the technical difficulties, how in the beginning for the first months she her free basic water wasn't loaded, how she would complain um, and continually walk to the offices and try and phone them um, to no avail. The final applicant for Samuzi Paki is somebody who has several backyard shacks on his property and very tragically one night a fire broke out. He was awakened by the sounds of one of the other tenants screaming and a fire had broken out in one of the shacks. They didn't realize that anyone was inside it but they tried desperately to put out the fire using the prepayment water meter supply. When that finished, they went to the neighbors and woke them up, but slowly everybody's water supply ran out. They then tried to get from ditches water. They tried to collect the water in buckets to put out the fire. They called the fire station in Jabulani. Nobody came. It wasn't, the phone wasn't answered. They couldn't put the fire out, the shack burnt down, and the next morning they realized when the mother um, came back from a night shift that she had left her two children in the shack and they had expired in the fire. After we um, got the go-ahead to go with the case, after we got the community buy-in and the social movement buy-in, and we got the advocates on board, we then had the Freedom of Expression Institute attorneys um, taking the case and being the applicant's attorneys. After that, we had to build the case and it was extremely difficult because we had to go through all of the policies, all of the fine details, all of the budgets. In order to mount a socioeconomic rights case, you have to become almost better at the city's policies than the city is itself. So the case is premised on essentially three legal grounds. The first is premised on the Bill of Rights, um, on Section 27 of the Constitution, which guarantees everyone the right to have access to sufficient water. Now, we say that the free basic water policy does not give people sufficient water. And it's very clear from international jurisprudence, as well as from South Africa, for example, from the very famous Grootboom case at the Constitutional Court about housing, that when we talk about access, we're talking about more than just physical access. So it's no good just to bring water from the river into a, a yard, into the community, into a yard, and then into your house. So it, physical access is certainly one component. But if you bring water closer and closer in a pipe, but people still can't pay for it, that's not access. So access is both physical and economic access. And um, so it's very clear that free basic water is part of this. There was an understanding and appreciation that we do have a progressive constitution. And that constitution in this case provides right to access, uh, adequate and accessible water. And we might as well use that and test it. Plus, free basic water is a government policy, um, which is clearly enacted in order to give effect to the constitutional right. So we are saying that the government's free basic water policy um, in the context of the right of access to sufficient water is unreasonable um, in the context of Piri because it's insufficient for large, multi-dwelling, extremely poor households. So we certainly are very much pinning it on the right of access to water and in that respect it's a groundbreaking case. There have been very few around the world uh, cases on the right to water and in South Africa it's the first. So in that case it's it's quite unique. Um, in the other aspects in terms of prepayment water meters, what we're arguing is that prepayment water meters are uh, amount to unfair discrimination. That's also part of the Bill of Rights. Section 9 of the Constitution guarantees equality and it um, it says that the state may not unfairly discriminate based on race and a number of other grounds. And we say that the rollout of prepayment water meters only in a poor black suburb is unfair discrimination because as the record shows, there are bad debtors everywhere across Johannesburg. In fact, according to the papers from the city itself, the worst debtors are not the poor, they're government institutions and they are businesses and yet government institutions and businesses do not get prepayment water meters. It's only predominantly black, poor areas that do. And so we say that that is unfair discrimination, which is impermissible and unconstitutional. We also say that prepayment water meters, in terms of their automatic disconnection, contravene the basic principles of administrative justice, of procedural fairness, in that they don't allow an opportunity to make a representation, and they don't allow um, the adequate notice prior to disconnection and those are based on principles that are 
everywhere from the common law through the Constitution and also in the Water Services Act, they are entrenched. So those are the grounds of our, our case.